artists in, in everything they do. So I wanted to give you a couple of uh, shirts from the center. It's all about hope. So this is hope in all the different languages. So let me tell you about you know the, the basic concept. I think the video does a good job of kind of presenting what, what we're trying to accomplish. So really, there's going to be a shift over the next couple of decades in terms of um, rehabilitation extending beyond the acute phase. As you know, largely the medical community is geared towards uh, helping patients in that acute period, the acute injury, the first few months afterwards called rehabilitation and then medical follow-up thereafter, uh, but very limited rehabilitative uh, efforts long-term. And that's for several reasons. One, it largely hasn't been viewed as doable in the past in terms of recovering function long after a catastrophic injury to the nervous system. And two, the, you know, the medical system is designed and set up administratively um, for reimbursement and to function only in that acute phase. So despite doctors and you know, clinicians wanting to help patients, they're, they really have their hands tied, you know, because um, they're, they're, they're working in an environment that largely focuses on treatment in that acute phase. So therefore, um, you know, the center that we built in, in, at Kennedy Krieger Institute, Johns Hopkins, is geared towards that post-acute phase, from discharge from the hospital to the rest of your life. And so when you come to the center, um, you, you, you get a complete medical reevaluation, you get reevaluated from a therapy standpoint, and then what happens is you get developed in, uh, for you an individualized, lifelong plan for rehabilitative restoration that you can do in your home, right? Because the biggest limitation long term, money is a big limitation, but bigger than that is time. Nobody has time to go down to a center three times a week. So, um, you know, modern technology, um, and the company RTI is a good example of this, um, has brought to bear equipment that now allows you in a real turnkey operation to do this at home. And, uh, you know, as you see them, oh, it's not on? Okay, now it's on. Great. Um, you know, it really allows you to do these things from home, so I, I hope that you all get a chance to, to visit with the RTI group because uh, they have some amazing technology. It's one of the, the first pieces of medical equipment that uses Bluetooth technology. That means that they can track every single patient in every single center to know how well they're doing, where, what needs to go, the, it, the, the, the bike's programmed to automatically progress treatment. And there's a series of things that will be developed along this line that enable rehabilitative uh, treatments to be done in a smart way in the home in a very cost-effective and time-efficient manner. Okay? So really, if you come to the center for um, a week or two, you will walk away with completely understanding uh, the theory behind this. And I hope that today I'll be able to get this concept across to you. It's very, very simple. That is, the nervous system has a better capacity to micro-repair and regain function than we've ever appreciated. It's not that we as humans have lost the capacity to regenerate. It's that our equation for regeneration is simply more complex than our reptilian friends. And there's several key factors that, after an injury, are so suboptimal that it impairs your ability to repair. We've discovered that activity in the nervous system is one of those key factors. And this is not a leap of faith. I mean, thousands of studies demonstrate that activity in the neural circuits is crit critical for every element of the, the cellular response that we're asking to occur in regeneration. What happens after an injury is activity so dramatically reduced in those neural circuits that it doesn't even stimulate maintenance or repair of the system. If you add some of that back, the system largely knows what to do. Okay. So, you know, in my view, the problem's not nearly as bad as what we viewed 10 years ago. It's much more doable. The second point I want to show to you is, is illustrate that what a pragmatic cure is. We don't need to come close to completely repairing the cord. 20% is good enough for near full recovery, okay? That makes our problem much more doable. For most people living with injuries, curative therapies are not, will not be necessary, okay? So I want, that should shock you a little bit, but I want to prove to you that micro repair okay, is sufficient to allow most individuals to regain substantial neurologic function and to change their life. Okay? And that these types of approaches 
of optimizing your own body's ability to repair and optimizing the physical integrity of your body are absolutely necessary for when the curative treatments come down the pike. So when those curative treatments come down, only those individuals that have maintained their body, avoided complications, and optimized their own recovery will they achieve a full curative benefit. You will not achieve a curative benefit without it. Okay? All right, so um, let's see, first slide. Is it working? Not yet? Okay. So that's the basic principle. It's based on this concept of activity, restoring activity. What's good activity? Well, the activity that you normally would achieve in a normal day, the normal movements associated with walking, activate a pattern generator, a little mini computer in your spinal cord that sends a pattern of normal activation throughout the nervous system. Okay? We know from development of the nervous system um, in children, in animals, that if you disrupt activity, you majorly disrupt development of the nervous system. Okay? If we reduce activity in, say, an infant to the extent that spinal cord injury reduces activity below the level of the injury in an adult, it will majorly disrupt development of that child. So predictably, it will disrupt spontaneous regeneration, and it does, okay? So um, uh, we have really two principal goals. We want to do this lifelong therapy for, for one. Let's optimize the physical integrity of the body. Let's take advantage of exercise. Why is it that in the United States, we're leading everything, but we're not offering the advantages of exercise to anybody with paralysis. I'll challenge anyone to show me a single person with paralysis who's optimized the benefits of exercise. Okay? In the Surgeon General's 2010 Healthy Report, they, they, they indicate all the substantial evidence that, 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 that says everyone should have the opportunity for exercise because the benefits are overwhelming. You will offset early diabetes. You will offset the enhanced cardiovascular risks. You will offset all the common complications that occur in the accelerated aging. Just like able body, I mean, thousands of placebo-controlled randomized trials have been done, not in spinal cord injury, but in other areas. Exercise physiology, although altered a little bit by spinal cord injury, is largely the same. It's predictable. So those benefits need to be met. Now, you're only going to get the benefits of exercise by using most of the muscles in your body. Half of the muscles in your body are below your waist. That's why people develop early diabetes, because if you have no muscle mass be below this, you don't have the machine in the muscle to metabolize glucose, and you develop early diabetes. Likewise, lipid meta metabolism is built into the, those muscle groups. You lose those muscles, you lose your ability to metabolize lipids appropriately. Your HDL levels drop, and you develop an enhanced cardiovascular risk. You reverse that, double the muscle mass, get back to normal, you will reverse those complications. So let's at least offer the benefits of exercise to everyone living with paralysis. So, you know, why hasn't this occurred before? One, um, you know, the, how do you exercise someone who's paralyzed? It's not enough. If you passively move a limb with a robot or on a partial body weight supported walking machine, you may get some physical benefits, but they're going to be marginal. Because like any exercise, you need to use an optimal resistance, right? And have an optimal workout. You know, if I gave a bodybuilder a, a five pound weight, you know, they're never going to reach their potential. That's what passive movement is, right? We need active movement. Let's use the nervous, nervous system to activate muscles against high resistance so you get cardiovascular workout. Now, the type of program I'm going to show you is not um, uh, extreme exercise in any shape, form, or manner. It is just the normal exercise that anyone would achieve with normal walking, okay? So, um, like, for example, with the FES biking, is it bad to do an hour of FES biking every day? Absolutely not. The average human being walks two hours a day, okay? It's not, too, it's not bad to do it for two hours a day, okay? It's just marginal exercise. And, uh, but that's already been shown in other studies to, to have profound benefits in the aging and in, in other things. So um, it's almost not possible to do too much, okay? Because time will limit what you're able to do long before that. So the physical benefits of this are, are very straightforward, are very predictable. And that's why we knew we could help Christopher Reeve. We knew that we could just simply help eliminate some of the, his medical complications, which were killing him, right? And, um, and, you know, anyone affected by these disorders knows. But individuals that start this program, like a Sam Schmidt. So Sam was injured in Indy racing, you know, in the Indy uh, 500s coming up. 
a very severe injury. Um, in, in he was basically a vent-dependent quad. He's seven years out now, has never had a bladder infection, never had a med major medical complication, ever. Okay, that just doesn't happen, All right? And, um, but that's predictable. That's just simply the benefits of exercise. That shouldn't be surprising. That's very straightforward, you know? Hundreds of studies have demonstrated those results in able body. We don't need to do those studies in spinal cord injury. They're predictable. Let's spend our time in spinal cord injury proving those things that need to be proven. That is, can we use these same types of activity to, to stimulate the nervous system to cause regeneration? So that's where our laboratory is focused. This uh, new discovery that activity can actually stimulate micro-regeneration. So I'm going to show you data that, um, that activity alone can do as much, if not more, than any current scientific evidence with stem cells or any growth factor, okay? And I want this to be a bit surprising, but the magnitude of the effect. We can achieve more axonal outgrowth, more myelination, and more functional recovery with activity alone than we can with stem cells. And I grew up with stem cells. You know, our group is about the first to report long-term stem cell repair. We're not going to be able to show your slides, it looks like. Can't you just put it on a, on a disc? Okay, well, let, let, me just, let me just tell you a little bit about the program, and then we don't need to go through the slides. Um, but it's, it's basically those, those, those principles. So let me tell you that, um, so we've tested this. So in animal models, of course, you can do an injury, you know, as, as you've heard um, from uh, Oz and others that simulate human injury. And then we can add activity by implanting FES units that stimulate pattern reciprocal movements in the legs in animals that are paralyzed. Likewise, we can reduce activity using clinically relevant drugs like baclofen. So baclofen, the most commonly used drug for baclofen, dramatically impairs um, activity. The prediction is it should dramatically impair recovery or function. In fact, there's already studies that show that during development, baclofen dramatically impairs development. So not surprising, it has a profound inhibition on regeneration and recovery of function. And so we've done the animal studies to demonstrate that baclofen treatment can impair new cell birth, the differentiation of those cells into neurons, differentiation of those cells into oligodendrocytes, those cells that do the myelination, and can dramatically impair myelination. And it's, a, it's, it's not a permanent effect. You, you can, with, with further treatment, re reverse this. But um, uh, baclofen is something that most people don't need, that with activity alone, you can control spasticity. So, you got to be careful. Baclofen is not something you can just stop. You know, you got to work with your doctor and slowly come off of this. Um, so th this is really the core. You know, I, I want to emphasize that the, that the benefits of exercise that I just described should be so predictable from all the studies, so predictable that the Surgeon General has said that every human being, you know, should have a a act activity and that there's, um, you know, a crisis in America that 60% of all Americans are not active enough such that it's impairing their health. Well, spinal cord injury is even a more severe condition. But keep in mind that limitations of activity are common to all disorders of the nervous system. So these concepts will apply to MS, stroke, spinal cord injury of any cause, ALS, MS, um, you know, uh, Alzheimer's disease, anything that impairs mobility, activity will be beneficial. So one I wanted, first I want to disclose that, you know, I do hold multiple patents through Washington University on this concept that, that activity can be used to stimulate regeneration. And, you know, this is all being managed by Johns Hopkins. And um, um, I do, you know, I was one of the founders in that company, RTI, although I play no role today. Whatever stock I hold in that company is held by Hopkins. But, you know, if, I'm telling you, no treatments will move forward without companies behind them, you know. And, it's crazy that a scientist has to go out there and stimulate a company to get started, but that's the way the world is, you know. And, and uh, so we kind of talked about the problem of, of injury, this idea of re reduced activity and reduction of activity so much so that it impairs um, restoration. I just want to show you a couple slides on the pragmatic cure, this concept that recovery of function is possible long after injury. I won't show you any of this because we won't have time, but I want to emphasize that stem cells have many roles. Stem cells do many more things than replace cells that are lost. They make growth factors. They break down the scar. 
Um, they reprogram the microenvironment. They do many things. And although you know, we as scientists are using stem cells to transplant all the time now, in the future, there will be almost no need for stem cell transplantation. Why? Because 100,000 stem cells are being born in your spinal cord in the hour that you sit here. Now, most of those go on to die. But all we need to do is harness that potential. How do we tame those cells? That's the gold. You know, that's, that's the scientific gold that everyone's looking for. When we put a cell in, either by transplantation or stimulate one to be born, how do we control it? That's going to be the key. And that's what Oz was uh, talking about yesterday. We mentioned that activity-based restoration therapies are designed to do two things. Let's maximize the physical integrity of the body to get principles of exercise. That's straightforward. But let's do it in a way that our science has demonstrated can actually stimulate regeneration and recovery of function. Okay? Um, Chris always had this concept of the transcontinental railroad and um, this idea that patients need to meet scientists halfway. And what he meant by that is you need to optimize your physical body and optimize your recovery so that when that cure comes, you can maximally benefit from it. Um, and provision of hope. You know, this, this old concept of false hope and all this is just a bunch of nonsense. I mean, I think everyone sitting here realizes that hope is an essential piece. You remove hope, you remove, there's no rationale in the world to remove hope. I, I, you know, so it's kind of an indeniable right for hope. So here's this concept of activity. That is, if we optimize activity, we can optimize the, the potential for micro repair. We're not talking about axons regenerating all the way across the lesion. Um, in most cases, that's not even necessary. We're talking about micro repair. Most of the, the cables across the lesion have a thousand of these hot dog buns called myelin on them. If you're missing two of those in a row, that cable doesn't work. The good news is you replace one of those, that whole cable comes back. That's the kind of micro repair I'm talking about. That micro repair can lead to major return of function. So normally we're up here after an injury or somewhere down here. How can we shift up here in a pragmatic time and cost effective manner? It will only occur at the home. These kinds of things will never be disseminated widely by centers alone. We need regional centers of expertise, but we, therapy needs to move into the home. It's the only way with major disability that this will become widely disseminated. So here's that concept, right? Remember, there's a big hole in the middle of the cord. Here's these cables going across the lesion. Everyone has these cables. Probably 80% of people with, with spinal cord injury um, have these cables and uh, plenty of cables across the lesion. But most of them aren't functioning properly. Why? Because the electrical energy disseminates because they're missing these hot dog buns here. You start adding those hot dog buns back, you start getting, regaining function in those connections. So in most individuals, at least two-thirds of individuals with spinal cord injury, you don't need new axonal connections across the lesion. New MRI techniques have demonstrated that the principle of about 20% of connections across the lesion is sufficient for walking. So let me show you this. This, this, is a, this is a pragmatic cure. This is an individual who had a spinal cord injury some 20 odd years ago. The head's up here, the eyes are in this direction. This is the neck. These are the anterior vertebral body, C2 through C5. This is the spinal cord, this dark structure. The white is the CSF that bathes the spinal cord inside the canal. Okay, can everyone see that? This is where the injury occurred some 20 odd years ago. Remember, the cord dies from the inside out, no matter what the cause is. The end result is the same, whether you have transverse myelitis, MS, or spinal cord injury. You have central damage and a peripheral rim of, of intact tissue. So if we cut a cross section through this, it looks like this up here in panel C where you see a continuous line outlining the circumference of the spinal cord, an inner dotted line outlining the dead tissue. The key to the organization of the spinal cord is that all the cables to and from the body are cable carried on the outside, not on the inside. So in fact, in animal models, you can completely remove the gray matter, this central zone, and the animal won't even notice it. So you can remove segmental gray matter, but you start affecting this outer donut-like rim of tissue, you start losing major function very, very quickly. Now, this individual is Asia A and remained Asia A for the first year, okay? This individual is doing triathlons today, Ironman. He's, if you saw him, you would think he is normal. Now, a neurologist would know he's not, okay? But this is a pragmatic cure. He's missing 70% of his cord at this level, and he's had a full recovery. Not through stem cells, not through this, okay? But this shows that this is all we need to achieve. We don't need to repair the cord beyond this. This is good enough, all right? 
So this makes our problem much more doable. Now, modern imaging using uh, fancy techniques like DTI, where we can actually measure the, the percentage of axonal tracts across the lesion, demonstrate that he has about 20% of the tracts left. It's very close to what the animal data predicted, that you know, if you have 20% of the functional complement of cables across that lesion, that's enough to largely be normal, okay? So this is really changing our thinking, and particularly mine, just in the last couple of years. These, we didn't have these techniques. We couldn't look like this into the spinal cord. So these are really changing our views. Now here's another example. This is a young girl who was five, came in with acute onset of spinal, uh, spinal cord injury. This is a giant tumor in the cervical spine. So the same thing, heads up here, eyes in this direction. Here's the neck. This is the spinal cord, this dark structure. And then here is a giant tumor growing in the middle of that cord. So she became acutely paralyzed. They went in and resected this, and she remained paralyzed for months. She's walking now. Now, this shouldn't be surprising. In small children, they have a, a much better capacity to recover. But they won't get that full recovery if we only work with them for four months. Okay? This took over a year to achieve her full recovery. But if we send someone home before they're walking, they will now guarantee it. You know? But with help, people can do amazing things. And that, that helps here today. So goals for restoration. Cure is not required. Remember, partial repair is sufficient. Partial repair can produce disproportionate return of function. Ultimate goal is improvement in quality of life. And as Oz pointed out, it's going to take more than one intervention. There's no magic bullet. And this type of therapy we're talking about today is not a cure. It's just a, a major improvement okay, in life and quality of life. And, uh, but most importantly, it's the first and most important step towards a cure. Okay? Um, but it offers hope. There's hope for everyone. Um, we talked about this. Pragmatic goal for stem cell repair is taming of these cells. These cells are being born all the time. We can transplant them. All we need to do is understand how to tame them, how to control them. I won't talk about this, but you know, it's been over a decade since we demonstrated that you can transplant embryonic stem cells into a rat more than a week after an injury and get recovery of function. So you know, stem cells it, it, have been advancing for quite some time. Multiple trials have already been done. We were involved in one of the first or the second human trial where we transplanted basically oligodendrocyte progenitors into humans to look at safety. You know, and, and sure enough, you can do these things safely. Um, and um, uh, so we're really ready to move forward. Next. So these cells, if you transplant cells into the nervous system, Within a week, they send axons out over a centimeter. These axons are growing more than a millimeter a day. Okay, you can double the outgrowth by adding activity. You can cut that outgrowth in, in, in two-thirds by adding baclofen. Okay, this is profound regeneration of axonal tracts. Um, this is the phase one study that we did with diacrine, where basically six patients with chronic injury were transplanted with oligodendrocyte progenitors. Thanks. But this is what we need to be doing, right? Although this is challenging. You, 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 gotta, you train these guys, they come from California. And, um, and you know, they're difficult to train, they leave with the towel. And, um, but I, I, just, I put this up to emphasize this idea that this partial body weight supported walking or gait training is something that's very common in most centers. And um, a lot of science has been done recently that stimulated a, a great deal of excitement. Um, but I will guarantee that this will never become a widespread treatment. Why? Because you can't do it at home. You have to go to a center. It takes three people to do this. Robotics makes it a bit easier, but those are a quarter of a million dollars. So great science has been done, but let's use technology to move it into the home. So what is ABRT? It's optimizing spontaneous regeneration, activity-based restorative therapies. Using yesterday's principles and techniques, of rehabilitation today, applied with a difference in time, space, and rationale. So the techniques that we use are the same ones that are being used all around the world. There's, this is a rocket science. We're using them for a different purpose, to optimize the physical integrity of the body and to stimulate regeneration. We're using them in a different time. We're, we're using them in the chronic period of the injury. We're using them in a different space. We're using them in the home, right, as opposed to the center. Um, and uh, so, we'll skip through all this. 
This is, there's so much evidence that activity is important for all the cellular events we're asking to occur in regeneration. It's surprising we haven't done this long before. But here's the concept. This is an oligodendrocyte reaching out. And this is the kind of dismyelination of one of these axons. These are the hot dog buns. Missing one of these causes a problem. The electricity leaks out. Adding that back adds a lot of function. So micro repair. This is most of which all we need to do. We don't need the major repair for most individuals. Oh, we'll skip that video. We saw it. But here's the idea with the animal data that FES can increase activity, backlifting can reduce activity, and predictably it'll enhance regeneration. And I won't show you all this because we don't have time. But we can stimulate cell birth, backlifting can stimulate cell birth, dramatically impair recovery of function. This is six points on the BBB scale. So those kinds of improvements that we showed you uh, in my scale and what I showed you yesterday, two to three points on the BBB scale, this is threefold greater with activity. This is showing normal animals recovering, animals that have baclofen markedly impaired. Um, if you stop that baclofen, they, they don't have a, any major recovery beyond that. So um, we need to be careful. Baclofen dramatically impairs birth of new cells. So if we measure birth of new cells, you can see that compared to the control, birth of new cells is dramatically impaired in the spinal cord. We're measuring right here. In addition, if we measure right here in the cortical spinal tract around the injury site, this is myelination. These are myelinating cells. This is a normal animal. This is what happens after an injury to the nervous system. You get dis demyelination. Here's what happens with recovery. Spontaneously, the body knows how to add some of these back, but it's partial. If you take back thin, it completely impairs that process, completely stops those new cells being born, progressing on to myelinating. Okay? But the good news is if you stop that back and add activity, you can get all this back. Here's the profound effect of, of reducing activity. This is an animal with embryonic stem cell transplantation one week after transplant. Axons grow well over a centimeter in white matter tracts. You add baclofen, it dramatically impairs that. Likewise, if you add activity up here, you can double this. All right? So, you know, we, all these major advances that have been shown around the world are incredible because it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's amazing that scientists are getting the benefits that they're, they're seeing because they're really being done under the worst conditions. You know, they're being put into an, a suboptimal system. So, um, you, you know, it, I'm very impressed with what I'm seeing around the world in terms of advances in repair. So this is how you can do it in the home. It takes modern technology, and this is one of these FES bikes. It's got a motorized system that communicates to a stimulator through Bluetooth technology. These can be tracked all over the world, and if you talk to the people from RTI, Andrew and Judy, they'll show you this. Um, the clinical data, I'll show you quickly. Basically, we, uh, let's just skip through this. I'll show you the, so we've done uh, clinical trials in large groups of patients, 30 patients in each group, looking at the these activity-based restorative therapies. In this case, this was a study done long before this company was started. It was done when I was in St. Louis using a different bike. And, um, it, 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 here's what happens um, to muscle mass. This is an image through the mid-thigh. This, this is normal leg. So this is the bone, this is the muscle, and this is the fat that we all have. With inactivity, it's predictable. You lose that muscle, it's replaced by fat. Three months of FES biking, just an hour a day, three times a week, normalizes this. And other people have shown this. So this is predictable. This will reverse, so we can double muscle mass volume and reduce fat in half through this activity-based approach. So it has profound physical benefits. Half of these legs are from the group that had standard therapy. The other half are the group that, that did FES biking three times a week. These are all individuals more than two years out from their injury, on average five years out from the injury at the time of enrollment in the study. So there's a huge difference between these groups. Look at the fat here. The muscle's almost gone. It's just a giant difference, the group that got FES and the group that didn't. But what was really surprising, using Asia, gold standard, we saw a major improvement of function, similar to what we showed with Christopher Reed. 70% of individuals that received the restorative therapy regained substantial neurologic functions, 40 points on this neurologic scale, compared to the control group, which on average over three years lost function. Okay? 
Now, 30% of people in the restorative therapy group did not recover function. Probably their injury was so severe that they didn't have many axons across the lesion. But the good news was that they didn't lose function. And they all got the benefits of exercise, which is reason enough to do this. So these were highly significant effects. You know, a doubling of, of motor function, an improvement in light touch and pinprick uh, consistently in all groups. But overall, here's what we found that most people in the control group lose function over three years. It's a clinically significant detectable effect. 100% of the RT subjects benefited, particularly with physical benefits, doubling in muscle mass, having fat. This, these changes are indicative of reduced development of glucose tolerance, lipid disorders. We also saw, despite doubling muscle volume, reducing we could reduce spasticity. 50% of individuals in the restorative therapy group were able to discontinue use of baclofen. 90% were able to go from polytherapy to monotherapy. Um, so those were big benefits. But the big news is that we impacted neurologic recovery in a substantial way. And these aren't cures, but it's someone regaining use of a hand who didn't have hand function. Someone regaining trunk function who didn't have that. Someone coming off a vent who was vent dependent. Someone re recovering bladder and bowel function when they didn't have that. If they were pre-walking and already moving their legs, walking. But it's not a cure, but it's an important step towards uh, those curative therapies when they come down the line. All right, so let's just, now we've done a trial also in children with the Shriners Institute. And now, this new day treatment program in Baltimore, what I want to emphasize is the, the recovery of function that we got over years, three years in that study, we're now seeing in, in months when we bring individuals for an intensive period to get them quickly up to speed and we add more than just the bike, okay? And what does this mean? This means the early recovery is not because of regeneration. We're just taking advantage of whatever repair you've already done in the years since you've had your injury, right? You can't manifest your recovery if your muscles are so weak. So that's been a big surprise, that most individuals have had some ongoing regeneration that's not manifested. And we can show that in really weeks by making, making the muscles strong and reteaching how to control those. So this has been a big surprise. Um, so I'll just finish here. This idea that, there, that a pragmatic cure is our goal. Partial repair, micro repair is, is good enough for most individuals. Uh, recovery of function is long at, possible long after the injury. It really doesn't matter how long you're out after the injury. What time does is adding complications. The complications you accrue are what limit you in the future. But your ability to repair and recover function is not really dependent on time after the injury, surprisingly. Um, two goals for ABRT, let's maximize the benefits of exercise while simultaneously doing it in a way that we can help your body micro-repair. Um, it's so important to meet the scientists halfway, so you know everyone needs to do this, but they can't do it by themselves. You need help, and you need simple programs that can, be, that can occur in the home. So we hope to work uh, together with um, you know, Cody and the group here and getting the new uh, hospital up to speed with this so that they can do this here. All these centers have the brick and mortar. The company RTI now has over 75 centers around the United States doing this. Okay? They're in multiple countries around the world. So really in a year, they've done more than the, all of NIH rehabilitation has been able to do. But that's predictable. Private companies can do this. They can move quickly. Um, hope is a very important point. Everyone needs it. So I'll end there. And thank you very much. Sorry about the mix-up slides. <laughs>